All righty. It seems like we're going to get started. So just want to start by saying welcome everybody this afternoon to our GBA webinar, Pre-Law Orientation for First Years. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting this. This is our, this is our first pre-law uh, webinar for GBA, so super excited about that. And I'm one of the co-presenters for this session. My name is Ulises Serrano, and I'm a college advisor with the LNS Office of Undergraduate Advising. And I'm also the pre-law advising lead within the pre-professional advising team. So welcome, everybody. I'll now hand it off to my colleague, Kelly. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. My name is Kelly Lee, and I am one of the career counselors at the Career Center. Um, I serve all students in the College of Letters and Science, um, and in particular, I'm also the pre-law advisor. So I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to you all, to Cal, um, and I look forward to working with you all. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our agenda. agenda. Um, this is a quick overview of what we'll be covering for today. Uh, Ulysses and I are going to tag team and give you five tips for our pre-law students, um, share some resources that you can explore on your own time, um, give you some social media links and handles for you to follow. That way you can stay up to date on events, tips, all of that good stuff. And then we'll do a quick Q&A portion to wrap up. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over. Um, we're going to start with our first tip, um, which is gain exposure to new people and experiences. You'll find at your time at Cal that there is just a plethora of opportunities, both on campus and off, off campus, for you to explore. I highly encourage you to kind of find what is most meaningful for you. Um, so if you look on Handshake, Handshake is our uh, job recruiting platform. Um, you'll find a lot of different opportunities, whether it's some work study jobs, um, local organizations, um, companies nationwide that want to hire Cal students. Look through some of those things and see what might be most interesting to you. Um, and then the other thing is you can talk to students who have gone through that process. On Handshake, there's a little Q&A section where you can ask your questions and see what your peers have also asked. That way you get a feel of what that position or internship looks like and see if it might be a potential match for you. Um, and then I also wanted to share that, you know, with these experiences and the pre-law track, you do not need to pursue legal based experiences only. Um, if you wanted to explore something in marketing and media, or you wanted to join a robotics organization on campus, by all means do that. Um, law schools don't require you to have legal based experience. Um, I think that it helps in providing clarity just to see what the field looks like, because I think a lot of times you know, students have preconceived notions of what it looks like to be an attorney or work at a law firm. And so you get to really test that out and see if it's the right fit for you. Ulysses, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, no, thank you so much, Kelly, for kicking us off with that. So I know that this space seem very fundamental, but the reality is, is that the exposure and exploration process is really critical, right? We see over the years when students navigate their Berkeley experience that they might come in thinking, oh, I want to go to law school. But over time, they might change their minds. And that is totally okay. Right, and, and the important thing here is really just trying to delve into experiences that are gonna help you have a better sense as to whether or not law school is the right path for you, right? And, and one thing that I generally recommend to students who are pretty set on the pathway, especially if they've already taken that time to explore and really learn more about law and what it, that looks like, uh, I usually recommend that students start thinking about the legal field of interest, for example. Right. So if let's say let's say you want to do things like criminal law, immigration law, environmental law, criminal law, for example, tends to be one of the popular ones uh, that I've seen with a lot of students here on campus. Something that I would recommend to someone who's doing something like criminal law is, well, try to find ways you can get exposure to what it's like to be doing work around criminal law. And one thing that I usually recommend is, well, if you're in the Bay Area, or even if you're not in the Bay Area, one thing you can do is looking into local uh, opportunities to perhaps work in the court system, right? Maybe you want to work with a district attorney and try to see if you can get an internship in their office, or maybe you want to work with a public defender, right? Or you just want to learn more about the actual court system and you want to perhaps 
explore that opportunity in the local setting. That's something that I usually will recommend to students as they try to think about the kinds of experiences they want to delve into. So as you think about your path and as you think about the different fields of interest within law that you're looking to possibly pursue, that would be one of my main recommendations. All right, so finding the right fit and the purpose why we put that in quotes or the reason why we put that in quotes is because fit is actually something that is quite ambiguous, right? It's, it's, it's something that isn't always clear cut and isn't going to necessarily mean the same to, to everybody, right? But, but fit really has to do with what is it that's going to work for you, right? Are there certain things in particular that you're looking for that you want to do and pursue? Right, because ultimately you want to make sure that what's driving you to do this work and, and, and driving you to pursue this path is, is coming from you and your passion or interests. Right. So the thing that you also want to think about as you think about your planning through your time at Berkeley, do you really need a JD right to get to where you want to go? I think that's important to think about because I think a lot of students sometimes have a very particular idea of what law is or what law school is, but it might not always align with what students are actually trying to do. So that's why we always encourage that students take that time not only to explore, but to check out their options, right? Do, do you need to have a master's in a particular field for you to be able to pursue whatever long-term career goal you might have? Do you maybe need to pursue another professional degree, another type of doctoral program? Right. So the good thing is that, that we have quite a bit of resources that are going to be able to help you as you try to figure out what this fit looks like for you. Because like I said, what might be a good fit for one of you might not be a good fit for everybody else that you might know that might also be wanting to go to law school. So you can meet with a career center. And of course, my colleague Kelly is more than ready to support you in this process of exploring what is the right fit for you. But you can also meet with one of us in the LNS advising office. We have pre-professional advisors readily available to support you in this exploration. I am myself the pre-law lead, but we also have other leads in other areas, such as master's and PhD programs, pre-med and pre-health. So those are just some little tidbits to uh, consider. Kelly, anything else to add on your end? Yeah, I definitely wanted to echo what Ulysses just mentioned. Take your time exploring your options and also talk to folks. I think a really great way when you're ready is to do some informational interviews um, with folks that are in the field currently. You can use LinkedIn alumni feature for that or even just interacting early on with law schools of interest. For instance, Berkeley, Berkeley Law commonly does, you know, excuse me, mock, mock classes, workshops, they do an open house in the fall, you know, interact with them, ask your questions, ask the difficult questions you want to know to assess if this is really the right fit for you. Great. So majors and minors, this is actually one of, I'd say one of the biggest areas that we often get questions about, right? And, and the reality is, as truthful or untruthful as it might seem. I think sometimes students are skeptical about this, but the reality is, is that law schools don't care about what you major in. They also don't care so much about how many minors you decide to pursue or how many majors you decide to pursue. I think there's often this idea that the more majors or minors you take on, the better you're gonna look for law schools or the better you're gonna look for employers. And the reality is, is that that's not true. We've, we've had a number of different admissions deans and directors come talk to us via admissions panels that we posted in the past. And they've made it very clear that they don't care so much about the type of major or the amount of majors or how many minors you decide to take on. What they care about is that you're actually invested and passionate about what you're looking to pursue, right? Uh, for example, if, if your default major, because your idea of what, uh, what law is going to be is, if your default major is political science, that's great. It's actually one of the most common majors we see for pre-law students. But that does not mean by any means that you have to be a political science major. That does not mean that you, for example, have to also be a, a legal studies major for you to go to law school right? There's a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of different paths you can take. Ultimately, what's going to be important 
that it's going to be important that you actually really care and are invested in what you are looking to pursue academically, because usually those things shine in your application when you apply. And, and the people that are reading your application, if you decide to go to law school or apply to law school, they're going to be able to see that you really have a vested interest in what you're looking to study, right? So like I said, despite popular thinking, because I think that that's definitely one of the myths I hear very often, <laughs> um, the, the type of major or the amount of majors or minors you take on have little to no bearing on your prospects for law school. Um, so the other thing that I also like to encourage students to think about when they're thinking, I might, should I add a minor? Should I add two minors? Should I add a double major? Uh, the other thing is really thinking about how is this additional coursework going to actually possibly take away from my ability to do other things that could really actually help either boost my application or help me gain more experience that I need to have a stronger resume for when I apply to law school. And, and that's, the, that's one of the really critical factors you have to think about, right? How, how are you arranging your time and how are you committing to the different things you're, you're looking to commit to as a student? Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot more that can be said, but I'll pass it on to Kelly to see if uh, she has any other additional thoughts. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you've covered already. I think sometimes students come to me and say like, hey, I think, um, or from what, from what I've been hearing from my peers, a legal studies major would benefit me, or I hear it vice versa. Or, you know, if I double major in philosophy and history, that will make me stand out. And the question I always ask is, is that interesting to you? Is that meaningful to you? Or are you doing it because others have said that's what you should do? So I always recommend students to just go back to one simple question. What is most interesting to me? Um, what is most meaningful to me? Because the truth of the matter is double majoring or triple minoring or whatever else, um, it's not necessarily gonna give you an edge, but it may overwhelm you, which really brings me to my next point. Um, find the right balance for yourself. Don't add things to your plate that you, you know, may not be able to manage. Um, set realistic expectations for yourself. You hear from your peers like I'm doing a, an internship with a senator here and then I have two other jobs on the side. And it, definitely some students need to do that for financial reasons and then other students do that because you know they've also been hearing from their peers that that's what's going to make them most competitive. So find what's most manageable for you because I do have students mid semester that come to me and say like hey I, I have to drop this internship I can't do it anymore and I feel really horrible about myself. When in real, when in fact they really just didn't manage their time or added too many things. So find the right balance for yourself because it is very much a holistic process. Your GPA and your LSAT scores, those things do matter. Um, don't get me wrong, but you know those letters of rec, the personal statement, the extracurriculars you pursued matter. I would argue just as much. Um, so find something that is manageable for you. You'll see. Yeah, so I like to use a buffet analogy when I talk about balance, right? Um, you obviously don't want to bite more than you can chew, right? Or, or make sure that you don't take on more on your plate that might end up actually leading to potential negative outcomes, right? Or, or might lead to academic difficulty, for example, right? So you really have to be careful in how you pace yourself because especially for those of you who really want to make sure you maintain strong GPAs uh, and be more competitive, right, in that, in that GPA process, uh, you really have to think about pacing, right? Because if you take too many units, that could lead to subpar grades versus, say, maybe taking a 13 to 15 unit schedule where things are manageable and you can excel more confidently in your coursework. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard via GVA from all, all of us in LNS advising, right, that that's generally our recommended unit range a semester, especially your first semester. And we, and we purposely suggest 13 to 15 units because we really know that the transition and adjustment to Berkeley is also going to be important for you all to keep in mind. But, but also just really learning more about what Berkeley has to offer will take time, right? And you want to make sure that you are able to manage things effectively um, because while it might seem like it's something that you just need to worry about uh, for law school, this is really just a life skill, right? Finding balance in your life, 
right? So just make sure that you really think about pacing and, and really be strategic in how you pace yourself. All right, so the final tip, um, of course, we'll, we'll have more time for questions and things, so we'll delve more deeply into some of these areas. But one thing that we often find, or at least I know for me when I'm talking to students, I find that students often really struggle with this area of really trying to build faculty relationships. And, and the thing is that sometimes I have, say, graduating seniors who are coming up to me and asking about how can I build faculty relationships at that point, right? If you're a senior second semester about to graduate, it might become a little more difficult for you to do that, right? But if you start early, there's immense benefits that can come from you connecting with your professors. And of course, office hours are one of the most common ways that you can go about doing that. Of course, faculty might also be open to setting up maybe one-on-one -on -one appointments separately. Right, but the reason why we also emphasize the importance of faculty relationships is because they can be not only professional mentors, but they're also going to be able to vouch for you in this process. Right, and you want to make sure that you build strong rapport with those folks so they can then in turn be able to speak better on your behalf. Right, because I know in, in my time in, in law admissions, there were moments where I would see some faculty letters where they were very basic, maybe a one paragraph, two paragraphs, very straightforward. You could tell that it was sort of like a template essentially that they had on the side that they used for a lot of students, right? And, and that's because most likely the, maybe the, the relationships were not as strong as perhaps the student might've perceived with that faculty member. So I really strongly recommend that you think about faculty relationships they don't have to be within your department also, right? So if let's say you take a class in another department from a different major entirely, that's totally okay. I think the important thing really is about trying to foster those relationships as best as you can. Um, and, and something that often can help with leading into connecting with faculty, of course, their research, right? They, they often like to talk about their research so that's a good way to get to know more about who they are and the kind of work that they do. Um, and also just get a sense of what it's like to even navigate the kind of path that they navigated to become professors. So there's that. But Kelly, anything else to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add on that reading the publications is a really great way to connect with faculty members. And in fact, um, my team and I did a event for first gen students. It was centered around how to connect with faculty members um, and make the most of your time at Cal. That video link is right there. Um, I put a timestamp, 1421 is where they start to talk about how to build faculty relationships. Um, so you get to hear that firsthand from a few faculty members. I also wanted to add that, you know, sometimes when you have courses with 200, 300 students, it's really difficult to connect with your faculty member. Of course, you can go to office hours, but Another thing to think about um, are your GSIs. You'll probably have discussions with courses that big, or a lot of times you will. Um, so think about how you can maybe build a relationship with your GSI. Maybe you see them more frequently. Um, and sometimes with that letter of rec, they can primarily write the letter and then have the professor co-sign it. Um, or even it could just be a standalone. So something for you to consider. Um, so those would be two of the biggest things for me to cover. Um, and then I wanted to quickly mention some resources for you to explore. So I created this Google Doc with a bunch of different resources, including a really awesome guide that Ulysses created last year. And um, the link is right here. So has that guide with a bunch of different professional opportunities you can pursue. It jumps into, or it dives into, I should say, the different components of the application process. So when you're ready to look at that, you can read about personal statements, what they're looking for, um, letters of rec, how to ask for that, how to secure those, different things like that. Um, so that's a really great tip. And then there are also some pre-law pipeline programs as well. This is a bit further out, um, but sometimes folks, especially like first-gen students and other students as well, will engage in some of these programs before they start law school just to get familiar with the terrain. Um, some of these programs also pair you up with a mentor, so that could be really useful. Um, so just something to consider. You can refer back to that sheet whenever you like. Um, it's there for you. 
Great. And, and some uh, really quickly to highlight some of the other services, which we might have already alluded to a little bit earlier. Uh, of course, we have a team of de dedicated pre-professional graduate advisors in LNS advising. It's a fairly new team. We've been around for a little over a year now. And like I mentioned, we focus on different areas that students might actually be interested in as they think about post Berkeley, right? And of course, I'm the pre-law advising lead. My colleague, Greg, who actually is also in this call, he is um, the master's and PhD programs lead. Uh, Davey, also on this call, she leads the pre-health pathways uh, section of our team. And then, of course, Brenea, also in this call, she also leads the pre-med uh, pathway programs. So if you're interested in exploring any of these areas, please don't hesitate to find us in LNS Advising come July 16th, because that's the, the first day we'll start seeing students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Kelly alluded to the JD admissions office at Harvard, or not Harvard, sorry, that um, <laughs> I worked there before, uh, uh, bad habit, uh, Berkeley Law JD admissions. So obviously, we have one of the top law schools in the country right in the backyard of the campus, right? So take advantage of that. The proximity is really helpful. And contrary to popular belief, because it's also a myth, um, I know that some students think that because you went to Berkeley as an undergrad, there might be a disadvantage in you trying to go to Berkeley Law. That's not true. The biggest cohort of students generally tends to be from Berkeley, uh, the undergraduate campus. So definitely encourage you to check that out. And then a quick plug for one of the partners that we actually work with very closely in the student body government. Uh, the ASUC Senate Office of Adriana Ingo. She is someone that we worked very closely with over the last year and a half or so. And they have been working and have been doing some tremendous work in trying to create initiatives to support pre-law students on campus. So if you're looking to get involved, right? If you maybe need an internship or want to volunteer for the office or get involved a little more in student government, uh, checking out her office would be a really great way to do that. So. That's my two cents on that. Yeah, and I just also wanted to quickly add, there was a pre-law decal that came out of her office um, and some other partners as well. Um, decals are usually one or two unit courses. They're usually student or they are student run, student taught. Um, so if you want to find community, because sometimes I hear students say like, hey, I'm usually the only pre-law person I know in my classroom. This is a really great way to connect with others that are in, on a similar path to you. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is the Career Center runs a bunch of pre-law events and other career-related events throughout the semester. Um, so if you go on Handshake and go to the Events tab, you'll be able to see that full list. We have employers that engage with us through coffee chats. We have career fairs, um, workshops, panels, all of that great stuff. And then I did want to quickly mention that um, you can meet with the career counselor. We have 30-minute appointments. Um, First year students do not have access to that for the first six weeks because we are highly impacted, but after the first six weeks, you can book an appointment via handshake. Um, and then in the meanwhile, during that first six weeks, if there are urgent questions that come up, you can still meet with our office. We have drop-in appointments, they're 15 minute blocks, um, and you can schedule them day of. And then just go ahead and go to our website, career.berkeley.edu, and you'll find all of that information. And then I just wanted to quickly mention, um, follow us on social media, at least um, the Career Center and also LNS provide a lot of great tips, resources, events that are coming up. So these are our social media handles. Yeah, and a quick plug too. Uh, oftentimes we are generally trying to promote important deadlines, right? Or important policy changes that you probably want to be aware of. So Strongly recommend you all follow us in the various different social media platforms that we have posted. Uh, no, ob no obligation, of course, but it's a great way to stay up to date, especially if you're already on social media. And with that, that finishes our presentation. <laughs> Kelly, anything else before we move into the Q&A? 
Um, I thought I'd say this before we jumped into, into the Q&A because some folks might drop off. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, as you go along this path at Cal, you might feel overwhelmed at times. You might feel like you're not competitive enough. And I just wanted to say that you belong here. You belong at Cal. Um, and there are a lot of awesome people on campus to support you and support your journey. Um, and that you'll find your own path, um, whatever that means for you. So come see us when you're ready. Um, yeah. Yeah, a quick plug too, not that we're finishing up yet, right, because we do have a Q&A component coming, but, but something that uh, also you want to keep in mind, right, there's no linear path to law school, right, there's no one way to do it, there are many ways that students make it happen, and let's say, for example, right now, even through your undergraduate experience, you decide that you don't want to go, but later decide to do it, it's still going to be very possible, right, law schools aren't going anywhere, they're still going to be there. Um, and if it's not the right time for you, that's totally okay. Um, and I say that too, because I know you're all still fairly new to Berkeley, but something that I know we often have conversations about is, should I go to law school right after, right, undergrad? And of course, I think that's dependent on the, uh, the person's situation, but just know that there's so many different ways to go about it. And there's no one size fits all answer to going to law school. All right, so now that we are done officially with our presentation, we're going to move into Q&A. Um, we have give or take about 30 minutes, so we have quite a bit of time for questions in case folks have any kinds of questions. Um, so feel free to type those in in the Q&A chat. Uh, our colleagues will be essentially bringing up some of these uh, questions that are being that are being brought up uh, and then we'll we'll work on addressing them. All right, so the first question is pretty general about the presentation um, and some of the resources that were brought up. Um, aside from maybe in the YouTube recording that we'll post there, what are some good ways that students can get their hands on some of these resources? Um, if it can be reiterated which ones are brought up, I could also probably put those in the chat. Kelly, you wanna to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we've got a lot of great resources on our website, um, in addition to what was already mentioned here. So if you go to career.berkeley.edu, um, you'll find a lot of great resources, including one page, um, pretty, pretty comprehensive page on law school. We also have a YouTube channel. We record all of our different events. Um, so that will be there, including some application timelines, um, application overview, different things like that. Great. And I think you brought up the um, introductory guide, the 2021 resource sheet for pre-law. Um, I could put those links in the chat. Is there anything else that I'm, I'm missing? I, that would be the primary one. And I can go ahead and grab the link and put it in the chat for you as well. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see. I have a, a question that was asked that I'm going to sort of expand on a little bit as well to make it a two part question. Um, yeah, basically uh, related to an overview about all things um, uh, research, um, your perspectives and advice related to being a pre law student and gaining research experience, its importance. Um, uh, how law schools view it and why it's important for for going on to law school and then also from a uh, then the the sort of the um, uh, clinical or in-person experiences uh, side of things related to um, the types of extracurriculars that students can be involved with related to uh, the legal profession um, and what are those types of experiences that sometimes students would pursue um, what are uh, what are recommended uh, resources to to find those types of experiences and sort of the question about consistency with those types of experiences in terms of like should somebody stick with um, a research experience or, or a, a, an extracurricular experience for a good length of time what's a what's a good length of time ha is having different types of experiences um, an okay thing. Um, so I know that's a lot of questions, but just sort of yeah, the general overview and perspective related to sort of the on campus academic research and the um, extracurricular legal experiences that folks can gain. You want to kick us off, Kelly? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to touch upon um, one of these first things before I forget. Um, should I stick with an experience for a certain period of time or, you know, like consistency wise, how does that look? I would say gauge it for yourself once you feel like you, you know, aren't learning anything additional, it's no longer benefiting you, you're not learning anything new, then perhaps it's time to assess if another opportunity might be a better fit. As far as consistency goes, you know, I mean, it's great if you can, you know, stick with an experience for a year, two years, whatever, um, but it's not something that law school admissions are going to hold you to. Sometimes students will pursue an internship for three or four months, um, extract what they can, develop relationships, stay in touch with those folks, and then realize like, hey, this is not interesting to me anymore. I actually figured out through this internship that there's something more meaningful in this direction, um, and someone's helping me guide or helping guide me in that way. Um, so don't feel like you have to stick things out just for admission's sake, and that if you don't, you know, they'll think you can't stick with things and you're um, inconsistent. I know I said those words a lot, um, but yeah. Yeah, so real quick about consistency. I think something that you probably don't want to do, though, is is because they, they will definitely pay attention to how often, right, you're moving from one place to another, right? Because the, the thing is, is were you, in a, were you in a site or were you pursuing an internship for a period of time where you were really able to extract, right, whatever you were looking to extract from that experience? Right, because let's say you're you're switching, you're trying to switch internships. I'm of course, this is a hypothetical. Let's say you're trying to switch internships every two months, right? That probably is not going to be a good look, right? So, so you do want to have a, a a balance between, you know, finding something that you know you probably want to commit to, so you can really get the most out of it, but also, uh, it's also okay to move around and try different things, right? Because ultimately that's that's actually what we were alluding to earlier, right? Uh, trying to gain exposure and exploring your options. Um, in terms of research, so, so research of course is gonna be critical to law school because that is gonna be a very key element to what you're gonna be doing as a law student. So research experience can really vary, of course. Some students like to pursue things like honors thesis as a way to really have a substantive project that you're going to be able to then say you either published or you worked on with a faculty member and, and they obviously were able to mentor you through that process. Some students will do things like URAP, right? The Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program, which is a program that a lot of students like to jump into, especially when they're new to research, right? If you haven't done formal research with someone overseeing your work in a long time, or you've never done it, period, that might be a good way to start and get your feet wet a little bit. Um, but there's also really other ways that you can go about seeking research opportunities. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of reaching out to professors and asking to see if they have projects and, and, and seeing if they're willing to take on more students. Uh, some students will do that to take on a project. Others, of course, like I said, will do it via programs like your app or an honors thesis, but there's really a lot of different ways to go about doing research. And, and it is important too, to have a strong research background, because like I said, that is gonna be a critical skill for law school. And Ulysses mentioned the Office of Undergrad Research and Scholarships. I put the link for you in the chat. I believe they have a, a newsletter um, or an email digest that they send out, um, as well as a database. So feel free to look on their website for, for opportunities. One quick piece, too, to, to make sure that I'm covering as much of uh, Greg's question as possible. Uh, in terms of like looking for sites for doing internships or perhaps volunteer work, um, I, I did use the example of, say, someone who's interested in criminal law, right, looking to the courts, the local court system, maybe in their home county or maybe here in the Bay Area. A lot of students like to go across the Bay to San Francisco to look for internships, for example, or maybe you'll look for some here in Alameda County. It, I mean, you have a, an array of options. And, and like Kelly mentioned, too, you don't have to do legal based internships. Right, there could be other things that may help you build skills and experience that's going to be important for you to have under your belt. And it doesn't have to be, say, a legal assistant or a legal aid or something like that. 
Uh, and sometimes it, it just takes perhaps reaching out to, to people that are maybe working at a specific law firm and maybe even asking them, hey, are you okay with me shadowing you for a little bit just to get a sense of what your day to day looks like, right? So there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing this. And if you need some coaching and support in how to manage this, because we recognize that this could be a lot of work too, uh, or you might not know where to start, we're here to help you with that. Does that cover your, your uh, question, <laughs> Greg? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Kelly and Ulysses, thanks so much for, for all that awesome information. Any other questions coming up? I had a question come, uh, come up and this is kind of going back to the double majoring and minoring piece. So if a student takes up a double major, will law schools take that into account when looking at their GPA and be more understanding if their GPA is um, a little bit lower than I guess the um, average GPA of applicants who might be you know, coming in with like a single major and may have a higher GPA? Should I start, Kelly? <laughs> uh, no, they will not. Um, because remember, at the end of the day, you're the one that made the choice, right? To plan out a double major within your time at within your time at Berkeley, right? So there, there's gonna, there's no, um, I guess, cushion or there's no uh, preference that's gonna be given in, in any or no advantage in any way coming from a double, triple major, however, however many minors you want to take on. That's why we caution students, right? Uh, as you think about double majoring, because the thing is, is that when you do things like a double major or a minor, you're going to be committing to a new set of courses, right? That could either help boost your GPA or it could also do the opposite, right? It could also hurt your GPA. That's where you really have to weigh right, where you are and, and determine whether or not that's really the best move. Um, and that's why generally for me at least, right, and mind you, I was a double major at Berkeley at some point. Um, I usually don't, don't recommend double majors uh, to, to pre-law students. But, but of course, that's ultimately going to be your decision to make. And if you need support with making that call and you want to know more about what it takes to double major, you can talk to an LNS advisor about it about that. Kelly, anything to add there? You captured it all. I think you, you got it down. Um, I will say that when they are reviewing your applications and they meaning admissions, you know, they're, they're going to look at your transcript as a whole. You know, there's, they're going to look at the, the GPA on your transcript and then also on your law school report, but they're going to actually sit down with your transcript. And I hear from admissions that sometimes they do that first. It's, it's really preference on their end. Um, so they'll be like taking into account like your course load, you know, um, what courses you're taking, things like that. But as far as um, any any leniency or advantage, yeah, the answer is no. We had another question. Um, this one should be fairly simple. Are, you, are undergrads, sorry, are undergraduates allowed to sit in on lectures at the law school? Yeah, certainly. So you can, um, it depends on the institution. With Berkeley Law, they have mock courses. If you reach out to admissions for the most part and say like, hey, I'm a prospective student. I'd really like to see what the setting looks like. Um, I'm sure that they can accommodate. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of um, institutions have student ambassador programs, like Berkeley Law is one of them, where if you just reach out and say again, hey, I'm a prospective student, really interested in environmental law, would love to connect with either a current student or an alum um, who has done this process is currently in the field, they'll find a way to connect you. And then even with the institutions that don't have formal programs, same thing, just reach out. It never hurts. You know, the, the worst thing is they say, no, not right now. And then you can always circle back or you could use the Berkeley Career Network, which is something that the Alumni Association at Cal offers. Um, it's a platform where you can connect with folks. You can just type in, you know, keywords. Same thing with the LinkedIn alumni feature. You can type in law schools and then find students who have gone through this process. Oh, yeah. And hello. Um, yeah, let's see. A question has come up regarding uh, letters of recommendation. Um, and in terms of if some professors from some departments letters would be considered better 
or worse than others. Uh, the question is, would recommendation letters from law professors be considered better than those uh, written by others? Uh, and then there's um, sort of um, a sort of an assumption built in here. Since the legal studies majors, academic supervision is by Berkeley Law School, would that, would that be of help with this? So sort of speaking to different departments, different professors, uh, and letters of recommendation. Um, yeah, could, yeah, could you speak to that a bit? Ulysses, you want to take this one? <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess it, it, it's, it's complicated, right? There's no clear cut answer when it comes to something like this, because on one end, if, if let's say, for example, you're a legal studies student, you obviously have an affiliation to the law school technically, because it is technically something that, or the departments ran out of the the law school, because a lot of the faculty are teaching both law students and undergrads, let's say you're trying to apply to Berkeley Law School, there's a possibility that there could be some leverage there. That doesn't mean that's the case though, right? Because each school is still going to take into account really more so the substance that you're, you're essentially going to be having in your letter, right? Um, I, often I, I think more so of trying to think about, I, I try to think more about quality right? Like what kind of, who's going to write you a quality, quality letter? I think that's really something that you probably want to think about a little more because yes, you could have someone who's a legal studies professor uh, that is affiliated with the law school, but are you sure that that person is really going to be able to speak in the way that's going to be advocating for you at the, you know, at the, at the, in the best way possible? Right, it's it's hard to it's hard to know whether that's going to be the case or not, right? Because technically, you also waive your your right to see the letters that people write. So it it's it's really and it depends, and and it's a little complicated. But but I really would say focus more on fostering the connection with the faculty, and and really fostering the connection for the sake of having a quality letter. Because if they know you more, right, and know where you're coming from, and 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 where and what you're trying to do. I think that's going to be reflected in the letter that they write. So that's, that's my two cents on that. But Kelly, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I would just say find folks that know you best um, to ask for a letter of rec. You know, I, I oversee this um, fellowship and I get letters of rec from like really prestigious folks like Department of State, like these amazing titles. Um, and then I read the letter and it's really generic. It's like, oh, they were great. Um, no details here. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't tell me very much, but this is a really great title and you have a great position. So find folks that know you best. Again, I mentioned before, like sometimes GSIs know you really well and they can actually capture a lot of the details and the skill sets that um, law school admissions are looking for. So go with that, uh, or that's one thing to consider. Yeah, so um, I also had another question come up. So this is a, uh, maybe a little specific because uh, a student mentioned being interested in learning about startup law um, in their graduate studies and not knowing if like taking up a non-traditional path is um, a best idea. And I'm not sure what that is, but they are asking um, if say taking up like a sociology and an econ double major, um, with you know appropriate type of um, course choices would help or hinder their application, and so I um, or maybe they might be asking about just startup law in general. Maybe what are some helpful things around planning that, or if you know taking up a sociology and econ double major would either be helpful or not, or if it doesn't really impact their plan. Uh, I can jump in here real quick. Um, well. I think we, we've sp spoken to the double major idea a little bit already, right? Um, you're not going to get any kind of advantage in, in, in taking on two majors, right? If you're doing it because you really want to gain that knowledge and, and perhaps even apply it to a future job or whatever you're looking to do, then by all means, pursue the double major. But, but in, again, in the context of law admissions, it's not going to give you a leg up in any way. Um, in terms of the startup piece, um, I, I, I would say if you're interested in startup law, which actually is, of course, an area that I'm not as familiar with, uh, I would say it's probably aligned with tech law. One of the best things you can probably do then as you, if you want to learn more about this and see if this really is something that you want to invest your time in 
is perhaps looking around and seeing if there are startups that you're gonna you you are you're able to intern in, right? Or maybe volunteer at. Because of course, if you're trying to learn about startup or tech law, you probably wanna find ways to get involved with a tech company or a startup, right? Um, so that would be my recommendation. But of course, the Career Center would have more resources on, on navigating that process, right, of, of pursuing an internship in these kinds of spaces. Yeah, I would say definitely, I'm not gonna speak on the academic side, I'm not an academic advisor, um, but for the career side, find folks who are where you are at, where you want to be, I should say, um, and trace your way back. So find some alums, I keep bringing up the LinkedIn alumni feature just because I think it's a really helpful tool. And then also identify some startups in the area or nationwide um, who are essentially where you want to be. Um, and just start asking those questions. Like, what did you major in? How is that helpful to you um, when you were creating this startup or um, you know, different things like that? All right, our next question is, if we wanted to take a major in STEM, would you suggest deliberately taking humanities classes to develop our reading and, or sorry, our writing and research skills too? Absolutely. You definitely want to do that, um, especially if you're looking to do STEM, right? Because that's definitely not a focus in the STEM disciplines. Uh, and you do want to have a strong writing ability, strong research skills, analytical skills, uh, of course, reading comprehension, a lot of the things that come from being often in the social sciences or humanities side of things, right? So that would absolutely be something that I would recommend personally, uh, taking some of those social sciences courses may, maybe uh, or humanities courses where you know you're going to be challenged to do more of that, right? So if, if, uh, if you're looking to major in STEM but want to get some of that exposure, yeah, make sure you try to get some electives in, in your schedule that would allow you to do that. Kelly, anything there? Yeah, I agree with that. And then also on the career side of things, look for opportunities that allow you to do that within the scope of the role, right? So, so you're reading the jobs, the duties and responsibilities, making sure that you're able to develop that skill. It's part of the experience. And if it's not you know, part of that, see how you can you know, ask for those opportunities and build them in as part of the internship. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, the next question uh, uh, relates back to internships as well, um, in terms of, you know, um, are there good resources out there that um, uh, students can use to um, identify uh, different types of uh, pre-law related internships that are available. Um, a student was speaking about how uh, lately they're more interested in social justice, public interest and policy and a current internship that they have um, working with corporate attorneys seems less relevant to their, their future aspirations. Yeah, certainly. So that document, the 2021 pre-law resources has a bunch of different opportunities you can pursue. I'll, I'll share some, um, some internships our students have pursued both on and off campus to give you an idea. Um, low hanging fruit on campus is the ASUC legal clinic providing community resources. They'll train you and then you work with folks. Um, so that's a really great one. The East Bay Sanctuary Covenant, Covenant, yes, that's the word I'm looking for, is another one. Bay Area Legal Aid. Um, these, I believe, also have a social justice focus. Um, so those are really great opportunities to tap into. And then, of course, you can use Handshake. Um, I would actually use the filters to select um, career fields, industries, uh, part-time versus full-time internship, whatever it is, select as many as you can um, to help you refine that down. Um, those would be some primary ones to look into. Yeah, and, and also student organizations, right, for example, are also a great way to get some of that uh, skill building and exposure that we are advocating for here. Um, and, and sometimes taking on a leadership role within the organization is going to also help you with uh, doing the kind of work that you're looking to lean into. And, and the good thing, of course, in terms of social justice and Berkeley, well, they're pretty much symbiotic, right? Like there's, there's no way you're gonna be able to detach the two. There's definitely many opportunities for engagement around social justice issues on campus too. So, and of course, throughout the larger Bay Area community. Okay, so, uh 
Another question, um, given the academic rigor of Berkeley, will Berkeley students applying to law programs um, like be compared to say the rest of Berkeley students or students like in context of being a Berkeley student when it comes to GPA or other factors, or will they be held to like kind of the same standards across the board, no matter um, you know what institution they did their undergrad? You want me to start, Kelly? <laughs> um, well, remember, you're not technically competing with Berkeley students, or you're not competing with Berkeley students, right? You're competing with a national pool most of the time, and in some cases, an international pool. So, so you have to think about it in the context of you know the bigger picture, right? So, at the end of the day, of course, a lot of institutions recognize that Berkeley is a is an elite institution. And expectations here are perhaps a little different from the expectations at other institutions. So some schools may consider that, or some people reading your application may consider that, but there's no guarantee or one size fits all approach when it comes to how schools review things, right? The way Berkeley law reviews applications will likely be different from the way that say UCLA law would, or UC Hastings across the Bay or whatever other law school you're looking to apply to. So I would say focus really on just making sure you have the strongest profile possible, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, you, you are competing with a large pool of students too. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, Kelly, anything to add there? Yeah, I would say just keep in mind the grades are just one factor for consideration. You are being compared to all the other applicants, not just from UC Berkeley. We do have some data on our website, um, just the, the numbers and things like that. So you can look at those things. Um, but I would say, you know, some folks are, some institutions are very much aware of what you're talking about and others don't. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and as law school admissions are reviewing applications, they're taking into account the varying perspectives, background, experiences that you have to contribute. They want to make sure that this is a well-rounded class, um, folks from all different backgrounds. So take that into consideration. Great points, Kelly. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, that uh, seems to con have concluded the, the, the current questions that uh, have been uh, posted so far. However, there was one uh, question uh, that Brandy provided a great answer to that I, I, I wanted to surface again, um, yeah, uh, Kelly and Ulysses. It related to experiences like uh, UCEAP study abroad and UCDC, and if those kinds of experiences are uh, from a law school admission standpoint are worth a student's while? Um, how will law schools view those? Could there be any things to be concerned about related to those kinds of experiences if a student is interested in them? Yeah, I certainly think opportunities like UCDC study abroad provide really rich experiences for students. In particular with UCDC, what's wonderful is, you know, when you're submitting your written components, you're asked to share what are your areas of interest, some long term goals, if you want to share those things, and they do their best to match you with um, an office an organization that does that type of work so you can gain some exposure. So um, I think that would be a really great opportunity. I wouldn't necessarily encourage students to think about it from the standpoint of like, does this make me look better? Does this make me look extra competitive? Um, but I think it does make for a really rich experience. I would agree with Kelly. I think about it more so in terms of what it's going to add to you, right, as 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 a person, and and less so how it's it might add to the law school admissions application, right? Um, because the, these these experiences are going to really help you delve into things that you might not otherwise be able to delve into, right, at the Berkeley campus. So if there are opportunities for you to perhaps say go to UCDC for a semester go abroad for a semester, maybe a summer. Those, those are gonna be really enriching opportunities that are gonna help you also maybe even expand your perspective on, on how the world works too. So I would definitely be an advocate of those experiences.
Oh, wonderful. And um, yeah, one last, uh, one last question came in that's related. Um, and it is, would you say that um, those types of, uh, or I'm sorry, would you say that those looking to graduate early from undergraduate school could potentially miss out on chances to fully experience Berkeley or have a disadvantage for law school in admissions in comparison to other students because they may not be able to take advantage of as many internships or extracurriculars? Yeah, I can, I can start with that one. I think like students need to, or want to graduate early for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's like, I don't want to add more loans to, to the pile I'm already, I already have. Um, so I think if you map out and have a plan of different things you want to pursue each summer or winter, I think that you can still have a really rich and fulfilling um, experience at Cal. I will say, you know, some folks decide to graduate early, or at least some of the students I work with decide to graduate early, but they don't go to grad school right away or grad or law school. Sometimes they work a few years, save up money. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Ulysses, you want to add anything to that? Not much more to add, but but yeah, don't don't think about it in the context of a disadvantage. I think more so think about it of what you can do to make the most out of that time that you will be right within the Berkeley campus. And, and also don't feel like you have to go, let's say you stay for three years at Berkeley, like Kelly mentioned, don't feel like you have to go to law school immediately after the three years, right? And actually increasingly law schools want students with work experience too, right? Outside of their undergraduate uh, experience. So if, if that's something that you wanna do to also help you explore and refine your interests a little more, I would definitely encourage that. We have time for another question. Um, I addressed one earlier about things that a law school will look for on an academic record. So we covered that they won't be looking for particular classes, that there's no prerequisites for law school. But I wondered if maybe you could cover a little bit of what they might look for on the academic side on your transcript. Things like course loads or maybe pass no pass grades. Yeah, so I, I can start, um, of course. Uh, pass no pass tends to be one of the big ones that that we get questions about. We definitely got a lot of questions about that over the last year, especially because we had some policies that made adjustments to how we look at pass no pass on campus. Um, but now that we're reverting back to how things were pre COVID from a grading standpoint, you want to minimize pass no pass as much as you can. Uh, if a class is default pass no pass, it's only offered for pass no pass, such as things like decals, seminars, research, internship, credit, things like that. Uh, that's totally fine. That could that could be pass no pass. That's not a problem. Um, but you, of course, want to still avoid the no passes right on your record whenever you can. Uh, when it comes to core academic classes, so think about, say, your typical three to five unit courses where you're going to have substantive work that comes in that class or that comes from that class, that's where you want to really be cautious about how often you use pass no pass. Um, and uh, Kelly, do you want to speak to that a little more? You covered a lot of it already with the pass no pass. You know, sometimes things come up, life happens um, and you may need to take them. In that case, I recommend including an addendum to just explain what were the circumstances. Um, but to Ulysses point, keep them to a minimum. Sometimes students like to have a number. So I say three or four, keep it to three or four or under. That would be most ideal. Um, and in terms of what they're looking for on your transcript or looking for a consistent load of courses. Um, Ulysses mentioned like 13 to 15, and that's what I would say as well. Um, sometimes students will take like 21 units and totally overwhelm themselves on top of the three internships they're doing. Um, so going back to balance, that's an important piece. Um, but yeah, I hope that covered um, everything. Did that answer the question, Brandy? That did. Is there anything else that you'd add to that uh, just on the academic side? I know we have a lot of first year students and I know there's a lot of anxiety about, are they taking on too much or taking on too little? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and honestly, I would say when, when it comes to preparing for things like law school or even other pre-professional pathways, it's probably better and even in some case smarter to play it safe, right? When we talk about 13 to 15 units as the range that we generally recommend, not only for you all as first semester students, but generally for law students or prospective law students, we, we do that with the intention of, again, not trying to get you to be overwhelmed, 
right? Uh, because we also recognize that you're not just students, right? You might have to work, you might have to do other things outside of school too that might take up some time and energy of, from your schedule. And, and we, we wanna be cautious of that uh, or, or we wanna be mindful of that. We want you to ideally be cautious too as you think about your strategy moving into the next few semesters or next few years. Um, so when we think, think about course load, again, 13 to 15, I think is definitely a good range um, in terms of how you arrange your classes, make sure you're, you're strategic also about that, right? When we talk about like saying uh, no more than two technicals within a semester, we purposely give you that kind of advice to not set you up for a position, in a position where you might end up having some difficulty managing the load, right? So a lot of the GPA, uh, knowledge that we've been sharing with you all throughout the last month uh, or so is, is really with the intention of, again, setting you up for success your first semester, but also to help you with the adjustment and transition to Berkeley. Uh, and also really just your transition to Berkeley and, and your the rest of your time on, on campus. I'll just wrap up with um, a final thought and then Ulysses, if you wanted to share one as well. Um, I wrote down here, um, take all the time you need to get acclimated that first semester, first few weeks, whatever it may, may be, could be a little rough as you get adjusted to this brand new environment and as we're headed back to campus. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say is as you're making decisions, gathering information, remember that no one has the answers or the keys to your life. They may have opinions, they may have wisdom to share with you. Take all of that with a grain of salt um, and don't feel like you have to have all the right answers. Um, you'll just find what fits best for you. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to that. I think that's really great parting advice, but, but really again, just trying to elevate the, the piece around balance, right? We, we really want you all to make sure you're also taking care of yourselves and your well being, right? That, that's really ultimately what should be at the forefront. And, and that's why we're also trying to be intentional in how we advise you uh, as to how you should arrange your schedule or even how the kinds of loads you should be thinking about or how many commitments you should be taking on. Uh, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure you're doing okay to be able to sustain this work in the long run, right? We wouldn't want you to get through Berkeley, be burnt out, and then try to go to law school burnt out, right? That probably would not work very well. So we really want to also highlight the fact that your wellness and, and well-being as a whole is, is also critical and you want to make sure you, you take care of yourself. And, and of course, if you ever need any support, just know that there are many allies here that are ready to help and, and we're part of that group. So uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And we look forward to meeting you in the coming weeks and months. Everyone, have a great rest of your day.